And Carlene, it segues very nicely to you as an instructor in the classroom, and I'm sure you've had many professional development experiences to get yourself to, to where you are actually implementing contextualized instruction successfully. So as an instructor at the Hub Center in St. Paul, um, you're on the ground, you're in the classroom, you're using contextualized instruction and contextualized approaches with the learners. Um, describe briefly what that looks like and what the work um, that you're doing is all about. Sure. Thanks, Laura. Uh, at the Hub Center in St. Paul, we have uh, really made a clear effort um, starting about five years ago to contextualize all of our courses. And that includes occupational preparation courses as well as our traditional ESL courses. So, um, for example, in the ESL courses, when I uh, worked on a team of the upper intermediate ESL course, uh, we call it level six ESL. And so we had a team of teachers and we decided we, we needed to come up with uh, something for students to grab onto. So we organized the curriculum around monthly themes. In the fall, we started off with a community and we invited people from around our building as well as in our community to come into the classroom and help students identify the services that they might need and connect to those services. The past few years at the Hub Center, I have been teaching preoccupational courses. And we have quite a variety of preoccupational courses at the Hub Center. The courses that I am working with are medical office as well as child development. And those courses are offered at the intermediate, upper intermediate and college prep as well as uh, beginning college level. That's part of a program called Fast Track. Some of you might know Fast Track or relate it to iBEST, which uh, is out of Washington. And those courses really lend themselves naturally to contextualization because it's mm -hmm. uh, very clear that it's part of a career pathway and students start off right away with goal setting and learning about those careers uh, and of course, we're building in all those basic skills, reading, writing, listening, speaking, as well as the, the soft skills that are required in the workforce. Great. Um, I imagine planning time for contextualized instruction has to be present. So as an instructor, can you talk with us a little bit about what the planning looks like before instruction is delivered? Sure. Uh, I would say that in the beginning uh, for the traditional ESL courses, what we did was just look at what we were already doing and we identified places where we could add authentic materials and authentic experiences. And, and the key there was that I was working on a team. I didn't have to do it by myself. Mm -hmm. There were lots of other talented people who were doing uh, the curriculum work and so we we were able to easily find materials and, and integrate that into our coursework. And with the occupational preparation courses, there, there are materials out there, so, uh, so that was helpful. However, it's, it's a little more um, of some pioneer work that's being done, so I would say that was a little more intensive. But we, we have some wonderful support at our administrative level, we actually as part of the Fast Track program, there are some grant funds to allow us to spend time creating curriculum Great. and working on a team. I know not everybody has uh, funds, but we now have a wonderful collection of material and we have some great partners in our community. So community-based organizations um, are working as part of that team. So Great. time, yes, it's, it's very precious, mm -hmm. but um, I would say that uh, in collaboration with other instructors and organizations, we've been able to make it work. Mm -hmm. And Hope, from your perspective, just following up on that, mm -hmm. knowing that you're delivering professional development mm -hmm. to folks, how do you address um, mm -hmm. teacher prep time? Well, I would say 
when, when Carlin mentioned administrator support, I think that's mm -hmm. always key. I remember many years ago offering um, workshops really behind the scenes before faculty engaged in a, in a full week of, of training, for instance, and supporting principals and administrators and program managers and saying, there's going to be some new things happening in this classroom. <laughs> and um, keep an open mind and really support them. And then um, when it comes time to faculty working together, particularly like in an IBEST model, mm -hmm. as, as Carlin's program um, operates, Certainly, there's going to be dedicated time for that, but that's key. Even if you're not in an IBIS, though, mm -hmm. if you have the opportunity to partner with other faculty members, certainly two heads are better than one, yeah. and a team all working around a mm -hmm. theme, obviously setting aside some time, some consistent time. It doesn't have to be um, a huge block of time, but consistently touching base, providing feedback to one another, sharing what's working in your classroom right. and what, what's resonating with the students, mm -hmm. I think, is, is always something to keep top of mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. So the development of instructional leadership as well within this piece, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another question actually for you, Carlin, before mm -hmm. we begin to open it up to the audience. So as we're dialoguing with this question, please think about if you have questions you'd like us to pose. Um, can you share an example of a contextualized activity or activities that mm -hmm. you've used in your classroom just to make this real concrete for folks? Sure, absolutely, and and I'll just I'll pick one that I think can be incorporated really into any classroom setting. Um, I worked on a team again. Um, we call them PLCs or professional learning communities at our organization, and we decided we wanted to um, figure out a way to integrate and as well as assess uh, those soft skills that all the employers are asking for, and so. Um, with some great, talented coworkers, and um, we came up with some rubrics to assess uh, teamwork, cooperative uh, teamwork, and also assessing things like attendance and communication, organization, organiz excuse me, organizational skills. Um, so it wasn't just the instructor saying you need to be organized. Students had uh, concrete examples of uh, ways to assess their own organization and they were assessing themselves on a regular basis. So we're introducing these soft skill rubrics into the, into the classroom and they're very, very effective because students had uh, just very clear examples of what was to be expected of them and they were evaluating themselves. It wasn't, um, again, the instructor saying, um, you know, your attendance is not great, you know, you need to improve that. They were, they were evaluating themselves and they, they knew what they needed to do to improve. So does that help? Is that a good example? Yeah, that's okay. great, that's great. And um, I'm gonna throw an instructional leadership piece back at you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. I always enjoy hearing you talk about your perspective on instructional leaders and so, <laughs> putting a new program in place or new efforts or a different way of teaching involves instructional leadership. Can you make some comments on that? Yeah, and we talked about this in the last um, webcast, but you know, any time that you're, uh, a, a local program is interested in introducing a different way of doing things, it's really important um, that there is a person who is knowledgeable and, and viewed uh, with respect in the agency and has a role to provide instructional leadership. Um, and so I think that when you're looking at contextualized instruction, you know, this, it, it, it can mean so many things to so many people. It's really important um, that at an agency level um, that there is a common vision for what you're trying to achieve in that program. And I think that is one of the most important roles that an instructional leader um, can uh, play in addition to understanding the kinds of support structures that teachers need. Mm -hmm. um, and you sound like a great instructional leader oh. in, in your program, <laughs> Carolyn. Um, I, I think that you know when you look at this whole concept of contextualized um, learning and con particularly con contextualized instruction, um, that a lot of people are applying it in um, kind of in the in the area of occupation and employability, mm -hmm. like the example that you gave. And um, I, you know, remember um, back in the, <laughs> in my years in education, in the early days of welfare reform, there was this whole conversation about contextualizing basic skills instruction in occupational training. 
And um, back then, it really um, was code for saying downplay the basic skills. Mm. Um, and it was not done well in many places. So I think that kind of the resurgence of this interest in contextualized learning with much more knowledge and experience in terms of how to approach it and how to really make sure that there's explicit instruction around the basic skills and not just kind of a, a hidden merging of it into occupational skills training is um, you know, something that's important and something that instructional leaders need to understand and guide um, in, in, in their efforts to do that. Right. That's a great, great point. Did you want to? No. Yeah, I was just thinking. I was Make just nodding my head. I know, yes, I saw a, that. A great point, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll open it up in just a minute, right after this question, uh, for audience questions. And I, I think this might be something that folks in the audience may be very interested in hearing about, given that there is a wide variety of folks um, that are involved in adult basic education. So, um, Cheryl, I'll start with you and then see yeah. if there are comments from Carlin or Hope. But what level of learner can you use contextualized instruction with? And that's the, that's all, that's the question. And I remember sitting in uh, many rooms of people and it, it would get boiled down to a conversation that we would title, how low can you go um, in, in, in contextualizing education? And I think that over the years, we've... Um, We've learned a lot about our higher level learner, and I think we've learned a lot about um, contextualizing um, for intermediate level learners. And um, many times when I'm in an audience, I throw that out to practitioners and say, tell me what you know <coughs> about it. Um, I have heard uh, programs say that they contextualize at the lowest levels. Um, and when I ask for examples, I hear things like you said about mm -hmm. embedding employability skills mm -hmm. in, into the curriculum or mm -hmm. um, teaching specific vocabulary mm -hmm. or pulling in people from their one-stop centers to talk about what job search mm -hmm. looks like and that they, that they um, say they get very good outcomes and they get very good response mm -hmm. from their learners. But I'm very interested, Carolyn, in what I, you would yeah. say. <laughs> Uh, well, I can give you an example. At the Hub Center, we have multiple levels of a retail customer service course. And at the um, advanced level, uh, we're using the same kind of curriculum, but it's uh, using more advanced vocabulary, more advanced grammar, um, more complicated activities. And at the lower level, it's, it's more basic. But they're, at both levels, they're learning the same skills. And it's just a matter of scaffolding it in a different way. And so I would say that you can contextualize any level. So, well, I know it's funny well? because Carlin and I were actually mm -hmm. visiting about this yesterday, yeah. just the, the notion of this and how, particularly within a career pathways program, how it's so important to really make that connection. So regardless of how low a level a mm -hmm. student may be, whether it's, it's you know, a pre-bridge program even, but really to open their, their eyes to career awareness opportunities and really begin to weave those, those elements in, even at the early stages, so. Great. Okay, we're going to open this conversation up for some questions from the audience and some questions from those of you online.